You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy, new fellow orientation series from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 11, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pulmonary function testing. Our presenter is Dr. Gary Salzman. He's the chief of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Truman Medical Center. Go ahead and get started. Welcome to uh, Conferences Online Allergy from Children's University Hospitals and Clinics in beautiful Kansas City, Missouri. Um, today is July 11, 2011. We have two presentations today. Uh, the first one at 11 o'clock will be on pulmonary function testing, and we're going to be joined by Dr. Gary Salzman in just a couple minutes. Uh, at 11 o'clock, uh, Dr. Har Harold Nelson will be joining us from Denver, National Jewish uh, hospital where he'll be talking to us about immunotherapy or allergy shots, which is something allergists see as a unique component of what, what we do. Uh, so we're, we're definitely looking forward to that. To just a few housekeeping things, um, uh, join us on, on Friday for uh, Lanny Rosenwasser will be talking about the pathogenesis of asthma. Uh, Dr. Dina Carr will also be talking about non-invasive measures of inflammation, things like exhaled nitric oxide and breath condensates and things like that. That's, that's certainly going to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, next Monday, Mark Dykowitz will be joining us. He'll be talking about rhinitis. And then Gary Gross will tell us how to do billing and coding, which is something that us academic allergists are not very good at. So we need all the help we can get. So we're, we're certainly looking forward to that. Um, also, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, these conferences are available for CME, Continuing Medical Education. We're working on getting CNE, which would be nursing accreditation also. We don't quite have that yet. Uh, if you have joined us live, uh, then all you need to do is to go to childrensmercy.org slash COLA. Uh, there's a link that will allow you to download the forms, fill it out, fax it in, and we'll be happy to grant CME credits for this presentation. We don't yet have accreditation for enduring materials. These conferences are all recorded. Uh, they're posted on iTunes, usually within one or two weeks of the actual conference. Uh, we've started uploading them to YouTube also, so they're widely available. Uh, but we're unable to grant CME if you view the conferences after the conference is over. Uh, we're trying to, to fix that so that at some point we will be able to grant CME if you watch the YouTube video later on. But we don't quite have that accreditation yet. That's it's a function of the state of Missouri's uh, uh, CME accreditation process. We're a hospital, and they don't have that accreditation set up yet. But they're they're working on it. Is is what I understand. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome our new allergy fellows. We have three brand new first year fellows this year. And would you like to introduce yourselves, uh, Dr. Dr. Sure. Federley? Uh, my name is Tara Federley. You're from Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. I'm Sinana Argo, uh, did residency in Little Rock, Arkansas. Little Rock, okay. I'm Nikita Raje, I come from Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan, okay. So we've got three new fellows this year, and um, our two second-year fellows haven't been chased away. They're still here, but one is on vacation, and the other is in clinic working with the, with the patient right now, but he should hopefully be joining us shortly. All right, well, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, our first presentation this morning will be given by Dr. Gary Salzman. Dr. Salzman is the, uh, uh, the Chief of uh, Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Truman Medical Center. Uh, he's also a professor of uh, medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Uh, he's an expert in pulmonology and has agreed to talk with us today about pulmonary function tests. So without any further delay, I will give you the keyboard. Okay. All right. Thank you. And is there a wireless mouse somewhere? I think it works. Yeah, there you go. All right, thanks. So there's your mouse and keyboard. And uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Salzman. Thank you. OK, so let's get started here. And we'll talk about PFTs. Just make the window active and this window. Now you can use the arrow key. OK, all right. So these are kind of the objectives to, to understand some of the basis of PFTs and uh, distinguish between obstructive and restrictive. Um, and 
be familiar with the, the indications of the, of the common testing. So really, when we talk about uh, pulmonary function tests, we're talking about uh, evaluating the lung volumes, flows, airway hyperreactivity. That's kind of the mechanical aspects. We have gas exchange, which would uh, entail arterial blood gases and diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. So these are kind of some of the overview of some of the testing that we can do in the pulmonary function lab. Uh, in your clinics, probably you're going to mainly concentrate on spirometry, and that's what we'll spend a lot of time on in spirometry. But you should have at least a background of what some of the other tests are and what you would need to maybe refer patients for additional testing. So we're going to evaluate a pulmonary symptom or sign, cough, wheezing, shortness of breath. Just from a reimbursement standpoint, um, when you order pulmonary function studies, you have to have a diagnosis. You have to have a symptom. So you have to have cough. You have to have shortness of breath. Actually, cigarette smoking is not an indication, a reimbursable indication for PFT. It should be, but it's not. So all these people have, smoke, have cough. You can you put cough down. That's an indication. Smoking, though, is, um, is not. Or routine screening is not an indication. They won't pay for routine screening. But Haven't you yet convinced people to stop smoking? Yeah. That's right. You're working on it. I'm working on it. So it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. So when we talk about PFTs, they could be normal, they could be restrictive, obstructive, or mixed. We want to quantify the degree of impairment, mild, moderate, severe. Uh, oftentimes we do it uh, before surgery to kind of give the surgeons and anesthesiologists assessment of, of what the patient's risks are. And then we do it for disability evaluation. Uh, disability, uh, Social Security loves pulmonary functions because they're objective tests. They can look at a number. Um, and so that's why oftentimes it goes into disability evaluation. So these are some of the uh, things that we look at. So volumes, what we're talking about when we're talking about volumes, residual volume is the volume of air uh, in the lungs after a maximal expiration. So a question for the new fellows, can we measure residual vol volume with spirometry that you guys do in the clinics here? No, we can't. We'd have to do additional testing. We'd have to do lung volume testing with body plasmography. So residual volume is something more that you would be able to, to do from uh, Spirometry. There's extra reserve volume, the maximum volume of air expired from arresting in the expiratory level. Uh, tidal volumes, just our normal breathing, what we're doing right now. Uh, inspiratory reserve volume. Um, so these are some of the volumes that we, uh, that we can uh, measure inspiratory capacity. A vital capacity, and that's what you guys measure. You measure forced vital capacity when someone does uh, spirometry. You want them to take a really deep breath in blow it out as hard and fast as they can and keep blowing until they can't blow out anymore. That would be a forced vital capacity. Uh, inspiratory capacity, uh, functional residual capacity, basically residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume, and total lung capacity, the total amount of air uh, in the lungs after maximal inspiration. So that's the sum of all the volume <coughs> of the total lung capacity. And when we talk about restrictive disease, that will usually decrease our total lung capacity. When we have emphysema patients with COPD, they usually have an increased total lung capacity because they have air trapping. Uh, and even in asthmatics, during an asthmatic attack, they will be hyperinflated and their total lung capacity will go up. Although when they're stable and they're not having bronchospasm, their total lung capacity should be normal. So these are some of the, the volumes. And this, I'm sure you've seen this um, graph before. Basically, uh, everything is total lung capacity are basically tidal breathing. Uh, it's tidal volume, and then we have inspiratory reserve volume, right? Uh, we have inspiratory capacity here, expiratory reserve volume. Um, this is vital capacity from full inspiration all the way down to full exhalation. This is residual volume, what's left in the lungs after uh, the patient fully exhales. So this is this is kind of the uh, the numbers that we look at. This number. Um, I really um, look at this a lot. This is expiratory reserve volume. This is the amount of air after you take a, a normal breath out. How much more can you, you go down? And this number um, is particularly interesting to me in people that have obesity. Expiratory reserve volume will, will go down significantly. So if I'm looking at a patient that has dyspnea on exertion and they have really pretty normal spirometry, and you know, their FEV1 is normal, their ratio is normal, and everything else is normal, Look at the extra reserve volume, and that's very, very decreased. I'll look at their weight and their height, and oftentimes this will be reduced with people with obesity and, and uh, restrictive disease from obesity. So this is a number you can get from spirometry, extra reserve volume. Is and that the, because their total volume is decreased, or is that resting expiratory level just shifted downward so they're breathing at a lower volume? breathing at a lower volume. The diaphragms are up, the belly's out, and they can't 
they can't exhale much more uh, than a normal exhalation. And that does limit people in terms of exertional dyspnea. So we have a lot of people that we see who are referred to me for asthma. They have completely normal spirometry, but their extra reserve volume is like 8% of normal. And they may weigh 300 pounds and be 5 feet 2. And oftentimes their dyspnea is related to their obesity. So the extra reserve volume is, a, is an important number to, to look at. I'm sure you have obese kids, too, and you may see the same kind of thing in some of the uh, obese children. So the basic measurements in spirometry, and that's what you guys are most interested in, the FPV1 is this forced expiratory volume in one second. And that's basically the volume of air expired in one second during a forced exhalation, starting at full inspiration. Uh, and then the forced vital capacity is the volume expired during a rapid forced exhalation starting at full inspiration. So FPV1, FPC, and those are really two of the primary numbers that we're looking at in terms of looking for obstruction, um, which would show a low FPV1 and a low FPV1 to FPC ratio. So those would be some of the basic things we're looking at in spirometry is these two numbers are, are key in terms of looking at spirometry. There are other numbers that people look at, the, what's called the FEF2575, or the forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75 percent of vital capacity. It's also been called the maximum mid-expiratory flow rate. And that's the mean rate of expiratory flow between 25 and 75 percent of vital capacity. So this number is a flow rate. It's not a volume. It's how fast uh, the gas is going out, the air is going out. Now, this is, number has been suggested to imply that that may indicate small airways disease or early obstructive disease in smokers. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this number. Some people say that this is totally worthless. It's totally um, effort dependent and we shouldn't look at it. Other people say, yeah, you know, it, it uh, does have some value. It's not a primary number. In other words, primary, I'm going to look at FEV1, I'm going to look at FEV1, FEC percentage. But I think that if this is reduced, if this shows reversibility, then what I'll usually say that this is suggestive of airway obstruction or suggestive of reversibility. So uh, because it's not, um, because there's some variability in this number, uh, I don't uh, think you can make a firm uh, conclusion, but it certainly is suggestive. And sometimes it's the only thing that would be abnormal in people with the early uh, airflow obstruction, uh, particularly in smokers or even in asthmatics, where this may be the only thing that's abnormal. So I, I do think it has a uh, value, but I uh, interpret it as suggestive. FEV1, FEC ratio, and there's been some debate about the FEV1, FEC ratio. And the COPD literature, the old literature, says that, well, if your FEV1, FEC ratio is less than 70%, you're obstructed. But they don't give any age to that. And we know that as you get older, your FEV1, FEC ratio goes down. And younger people have a higher FEV1, FEC ratio. And so the current thinking is it really should look at what your predicted FEV1, FEC ratio is. If it's below the predicted, then that would indicate obstruction. And that's probably a, a better way to look at it, because if we just use 70% for everybody, we're going to underdiagnose obstruction in younger people. We're going to overdiagnose obstruction in older people. So an 80-year-old may have an FEV1, FEC ratio of 65, and that could be normal. Whereas a 20-year-old may have an FEV1, FEC ratio of 80%, and that could be obstruction. So it depends on how old they are, and we do have predictions for ratios, and probably that's what we should use, not to use that standard 70%, which uh, um, is probably OK for someone that's my age that's 55 years old, but everybody's not 55 years old. Um, so uh, you need to um, adjust for that. The flow volume loop, and we'll look at flow volume loops. And in fact, I would encourage you, that would be the first thing that I look at. I so look at the flow volume loop before I look at any numbers. I want to look at see if this is an adequate effort. Uh, I want to look at the, the characteristics of the flow volume loop. So really, this is very important. And the volume time graph is also important. We want to make sure that this is an adequate um, uh, effort. And that would mean that I would like to, to have people breathe out at least six seconds or at least have a flattening of the volume time at the end of the, of the tracing. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So when you're looking at the test, first, is it interpretable? Uh, if you've got bad you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data, you're really not going to be able to make good conclusions about it. So you have to see, is it a, is it a valid test? Is it a valid um, effort? Did the patient do the test correctly? That's important. Next, is it, is it normal? Is it either normal or abnormal? Um, 
And then if it's abnormal, what's the pattern? Is it restrictive? Is it obstructive? Is it mixed? And then what's the severity? And then what does that mean for the patient in terms of um, diagnosis or therapy? So these are some of the questions you want to ask yourself in terms of pulmonary functions. So acceptable spirometry, we want a smooth, continuous curve, a rapid upstroke. The time to peak flow should be less than 120 milliseconds. Uh, upward concavity, and we'll look at the, the, the tracing. And we like to see at least a six seconds of expiratory time uh, or a plateau of, of the volume change over time. So we want the, the curve to start to flatten out. So this is the, the volume time curve. And so as you can see, volume rises up very rapidly, uh, and then it plateaus. Uh, it's more than six seconds, and the, the curve is flattened. By flattened, I mean is if this curve is continuing to go up, then we're not at steady state. So then uh, we're not where we want to be. So. Uh, this is an adequate effort in terms of um, six seconds, and it's also flat, so that this would be acceptable. This is flow volume, so this is flow on this uh, 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 realm, and then this is volume here. And then um, this level here is actually the peak expiratory flow rate, but this is in liters per second. Uh, and uh, the handheld peak flow meters that people use, that's in liters per minute. So if you want to convert, you just simply take this number and multiply it times 60, right? So if this is 9, and then multiply it times 60, that would be 540. So if you want to look at the patient's uh, spirometry and you want to see what, compare that with their home peak flow meters, you can just multiply this number by 60 to get the units the same. This is liters per second. The handheld peak flow meters are liters per minute. So you just multiply this number by 60. So normal results are defined by the 95% confidence interval. So normal range is in the values which 95% of healthy people will fall. And it depends on your height, your age, your sex, racial, and ethnic background. And so um, part of getting normals is we want to get thousands of normals and then compare that to them. But 95% uh, confidence interval is really the defining normal. And that's an important thing because there's a lot of debate in pulmonary functions is what's normal and what's abnormal. So most people have agreed in this 95% confidence interval in terms of normal people. So um, the first thing after you look at the flow volume loop to see what the pattern is. How the question of how come weight doesn't play a part in that? It, it really goes off of height. Uh, height and then weight may affect it, but then weight would actually give you a pathological problem. So if you're restrictive, we don't take into account if you weigh 300 pounds and your FPC should be lower. If your FPC is lower, then that's abnormal. So weight. Although it influences pulmonary functions, it doesn't normalize them because it is, we consider that a pathological condition. So yeah, if 300 pounds and your force valve capacity is reduced, then that's abnormal. It's not normal for a 300 pounder. It's right, abnormal. right. Otherwise they would normalize it and say, oh, well, that's normal that he can't breathe. Right. Which really isn't. Which because isn't. We don't want that. Although height is obviously not a pathological, but the taller you are, yes. the higher your FEV1 is going to be. The shorter you are, the lower your FEV1. We tell people to lose weight, not height. All right, you can't. Yeah, you can't. Uh, you can't get uh, smaller. Right. So, uh, so these are the uh, are the, the normals. Um, so, the and the would be related to the height. And then I think also body. Um, morphology. Yeah, morphology. Right. So there's African Americans have different normals than Caucasians. Uh, uh, Asian Asian American Asians have different. And obviously, we're limited by how many different ethnic groups that we have. I think they have Asian, African American, and white, uh, and Hispanic. I think that's about it. I don't think they have, you know, Eskimos or, you know, any kind of uh, other things. So the, what you want to look at is you want to look at the ratio, the FPV1 FPC ratio. And by reduced, being reduced below what's predicted for that person's um, age. Uh, if it is reduced, then we um, um, are thinking about obstructive. If the FPV1 FPC ratio is normal, then we look at the force vital capacity. If that's reduced, then we think this could be restricted. If it's not reduced, if it's normal, then we think uh, that this could be uh, normal. So if FPV1 FPC ratio are normal. So after you look at the curve, the next thing you want to look at is the ratio and see whether the ratio is reduced, normal, uh, normal or increased. Basically, uh, you can have an increased uh, ratio and restrictive or a normal ratio. Uh, severity of obstruction, um, this is how it's been traditionally looked at, 65 to 80 percent mild, moderate 65 to 50, severe, and very severe, less than 35 percent of predicted. So on obstructive uh, defects, we look at FEV1 to base severity on. 
And then, again, this is dependent on if you have an adequate test. But this is kind of the severity level that we use in terms of mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. A bronchodilator response, this is obviously important to you guys when you're looking at people with asthma, trying to look at whether there is a bronchodilator response. Um, although um, it would be really nice if every asthmatic had a bronchodilator response and, and every COPD patient would not have a bronchodilator response. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. There are a significant number of asthmatics that don't have a bronchodilator response, and there are some COPD patients that do have significant bronchodilator response. So it's not that easy, but in general, uh, asthma tends to have more bronchodilator response. COPD tends to not have a bronchodilator response. And why? how we define that is we look at either FEV1 or forced vital capacity, either one, and that has to be a 12% and 200 cc increase after the administration of bronchodilators. So it has to be both. The reason that we have to have both is that we have people with COPD that have an FEV1 of a liter. It doesn't take much to get 12% if your FEV1 is only a liter. And so that's why we put in that you have to have 200 cc's and 12% uh, in order to meet that uh, criteria for bronchodilator response. And certain, yeah. but we have some children, mm -hmm. once in a while, mm -hmm. who improve 200 mm cc's but don't shift 12%. Well uh, and these don't actually look at FEC for the most part in mathematics. Should we be looking at that? Yeah, it should. FEC, FEC will improve. FEC right. will improve right. with bronchodilators. And so you can look at either one, FEV1 or FEC. And really, for the definition, it has to be both, 12% and 200 cc. So, I mean, if you start off with a FEV1 of you know, 4 liters, you're going to have to have way over 200 cc's to get 12%. Right. So it has to be both, 12% and 200 cc. There's also this recent studies in pediatric literature that 8% may be considered significant for many asthmatics because children have better right. function. Right. I mean, I, I think that that, you know, um, that's been debated. In fact, the reason they came up with 12% is it was at a big American Thoracic Society conference. Half the people wanted 10%, half them wanted 15%. <laughs> so they split the difference. They split the difference to 12. So there's really not anything magical about 12. It was like half people wanted 10 and half people wanted 15. So they said, okay, well, I need 12. So, you know, obviously, you know, you have to use your clinical judgment. If, if you, somebody has 11.5% reversibility, and you think that they have asthma, then you know you go off your clinical. Um, but I mean, on in terms of strict, you know, PFTs, that's the definition. There are some there are some strict definitions, and you have to cut the line somewhere. I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere where you're saying this is reversibility and this is not reverse. And this is what's used for research studies. So if we have a patient that we want to put in an asthma study, we got to show this reversibility because otherwise people will criticize us and say, well, they're not asthmatics. They you know, they have reversibility. So this is part of the reason that there are firm criteria, because when you're doing research, you have to make sure that you have a, you know, the, a consistent group of patients. So this is uh, you know, the bronchodilator response. OK, restrictive abnormalities that go off at usually total lung capacity, a mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, and this is based on total lung capacity. For restrictive, we, I really, we like to look at total lung capacity, so we want to do lung volume. Force vital capacity can, you know, give you some suggestion, but you really, if you're looking at restrictive lung disease, you want to do lung volumes, and you want to look at total lung capacity. So that's um, that's what we look at. Uh, restrictive abnormality. If you don't have a TLC, you can look at force vital capacity. But again, when I read pulmonary functions and I see this, I say the reduction in FVC suggests a restrictive defect. I recommend lung volumes because that's the gold standard. So I will recommend lung volumes. And uh, if the force valve capacity is reduced, then there's a restrictive, a suggestion of a restrictive abnormality. Okay, so these are flow volume loops. We're looking at uh, flow versus volume. Uh, obviously, we have here an uh, uh, instructive pattern where you have this kind of um, uh, eaten out uh, um, um, appearance here. Um, we have uh, a normal pattern. Uh, we have a restrictive pattern that would be a lower volume. Um, the gas volume, if you look at flow versus volume, would be obstructive, normal, and restrictive. So these are some of the different um, flow volume. Now, when we look at flow volume loops, we can also look at if there's obstruction in the upper airway or if there's obstruction into thoracic. And we can look at flow volume loops. And a couple different patterns we can see. We can see a fixed upper airway obstruction, a variable extra thoracic. Uh, upper um, uh, 
airway obstruction or a variable intrathoracic um, uh, upper airway obstruction. So this is a fixed upper airway obstruction. So this would be like a tumor uh, that would be, you know, a laryngeal tumor that would be completely fixed. And so we have a flat inspiratory loop, and we got a pretty flat expiratory loop. And so both limbs are flattened, so this would indicate more of a fixed upper obstructive process uh, when you have flattening of both inspiratory and expiratory loops. And this is a patient that did have a tumor uh, in, the, um, in the throat. And that, I think, is an important thing. It, you see somebody that's wheezing and short of breath, and it may not be lower airway. It may be upper airway. So you can get some uh, suggestion from your spirometry you hate to be treating somebody with a laryngeal tumor with bronchodilators and inhaled steroids. They're not going to help them. Uh, you really need to diagnose their, their upper uh, airway obstruction. Variable extrathoracic obstruction is where you have a flattened inspiratory limb. And so what happens here is during exhalation, uh, uh, the airway is forced out, and then you can overcome that obstruction. And you have a normal expiratory limb. This is expiration. That's normal. Um, looks like a sailboat. And then, but in inspiration, you create negative pressure here. It sucks this together, and then you have um, obstruction. And so you have a flattened inspiratory loop. So this is a variable extrathoracic upper uh, airway obstruction. So usually the patient could have inspiratory strider, uh, an inspiratory flattened inspiratory limb. Probably one of the commonest things we see with this pattern is vocal cord dysfunction where a patient's uh, vocal cords, instead of opening up during in inhalation, they come together with the posterior chinking, and you can get this flattening. Uh, but there are some tumors that are floppy tumors in the cords, too, that can cause this also, that, that are not fixed tumors that are more, uh, or polyps, uh, that can, uh, uh, can do this. So this alone does not diagnose vocal cord dysfunction. A patient would have to have their vocal cords looked at and, and be uh, diagnosed with this, because you don't want to just go off of this and say you have vocal cord dysfunction. You would want their vocal cords to be looked at to make sure they don't have any anatomically flopping in and out of their upper airway. You can also see this with uh, one vocal cord that's paralyzed. They have a vocal cord paralysis. Uh, you can see this. I've seen that before. A patient referred to me for asthma, ended up having a vocal cord paralysis after thyroid surgery. Um, so. You know, it's always, and that's why it's important to look at these and to think beyond the box of, you know, uh, everyone doesn't have asthma that comes to see you. Um, they can have other things, so you have to keep your, your, um, your mind open. A variable intrathoracic, this is not very common. In fact, this would be fairly rare. So this would be a ball valve type, uh, usually a benign tumor uh, in the trachea, where basically you have a normal inspiratory limb, but you have a flattening of the expiratory limb. Um, because uh, during uh, exhalation, um, you're having uh, endothoracic pressure go down, and you're having a collapse here. Inspiration, you're actually uh, negative pressure pulls it uh, through, and so you have a negative, you have a normal inspiratory limb, but you have a flattening of the expiratory limb. And that would be a variable intrathoracic uh, obstruction, and that would be like a usually benign tracheal tumor. So lung volumes, as we talked about, you can't measure um, residual volume with that, um, with just with spirometry. Uh, and so what we do is we measure functional residual capacity. Um, and uh, we do that either two ways, helium dilution or body plasmography. Helium dilution is where they actually breathe in helium. You breathe in the helium and you exhale the helium, and then you, you do the calculation that way. The problem with helium dilution is in our patients with COPD, they have a lot of air trapping, and they have hyperinflation and emphysema that's a bulli. They have such bad airway obstruction that the helium may not get to some of these big bulli. And so helium tends to underestimate uh, lung volumes, particularly in emphysema patients. So that's why we don't routinely use helium, because it will um, uh, underestimate uh, lung volumes. The other thing is, let's say if you have a perforated tympanic membrane, and you breathe in helium, and it all goes out through your ear. Um, <laughs> then obviously that's not going to be. So body plasmography we, we generally use. And the re reason we use body plasmography is, just, is that um, what we're doing is calculating the whole thoracic volume, uh, whether it uh, communicates whether with the bronchus or not. We want to look at the total volume here. And it's really a mathematical deal. Basically, we have them in this box. We seal them in this box. We know the pressure uh, in the box. We know the volume in the box. We have the patient. Um, breathe on this pneumotac, and we can measure the pressure in their lung. 
And so then we can calculate the one unknown, which is the volume. So pressure volume in the box we know, pressure uh, in the lungs we measure, and then volume, the total thoracic volume, we can calculate. Obviously, the patient has to fit in the box. They can not be, you know, um, afraid of small places. Um, but it, it does give us a pretty accurate um, measurement of their, of their total lung volume. Do you have one? Yeah, we've got one. Yeah. And the helium thing? We do, we do not do helium anymore. I don't even think we're set up to do it because, um, because of the problem in emphysema. Mm -hmm. we, we just don't do it. Some places will still do helium, uh, but, you know, it, it does have problems in terms of, uh, uh, you know, accurately. This is really a more accurate way of measuring lung volumes. You, in this, you can go down to what, age four? I don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know. I have a body box here. Yeah, I I mean, you have to have some cooperation. The patient has to pant. You have to pant, and then it, it actually clicks off, so that because you have to have zero flow when they measure the pressure, so that they pant, and then there's a thing that clicks down, and then it measures their pressure. So that they, you have to have some degree of cooperation with the patient. Uh, now, we also do diffusing capacity. We want to look at how well the oxygen can diffuse across from the uh, alveoli to the capillary. And what we use is very, very small amounts of carbon monoxide, not enough to hurt anybody. But we use carbon monoxide because it has such a high affinity to hemoglobin that that's taken out of the formula in terms of it's so avidly bound to hemoglobin that it's almost immediate. So what we really want to know is that transfer of gas across the alveolar capillary surface and how well it gets across uh, uh, from the alveolus to the uh, capillary and then binds to hemoglobin. So basically they breathe in some carbon monoxide and then breathe it out. We measure what we put in and we measure what we take out. And what was obviously doesn't come back was uh, bound to hemoglobin. And so that's why we use carbon monoxide um, diffusing capacity. This test is not, uh, is not the best test. In other words, um, you know, you can't say somebody that's 79% of predicted, oh, well, that's abnormal. You usually use 80% as a cutoff. Usually, um, I will have to, they'll have to be below 50 or 60% of predicted before I'm even going to say it's abnormal because there is a lot of variability in this test, and it's not. Uh, and then also, what we like to do is, particularly in uh, interstitial lung disease, measure this serially. So we want to look at um, serial measurements. So a single measurement isn't as helpful as multiple measurements over time. But clearly, if they're below 50 percent, then that's, that's abnormal. So some of the factors that can lower diffusion, uh, low lung volumes, anemia, recent smoking, COPD. Uh, there's things that increase uh, diffusion, uh, polycythemia. Uh, alveolar hemorrhage. So kids with uh, alveolar hemorrhage, actually if you have blood in your alveolar space, you're going to have an, actually an increased uh, diffusion, elevated altitude. Uh, the other things that can decrease it is interstitial lung disease. We see a lot of sarcoid, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, pulmonary embolism can, uh, can decrease diffusion, uh, pneumocystis, uh, emphysema. So all these kind of things can, can decrease diffusion. Now one of the things when I'm trying to differentiate somebody asthma for COPD, would you think asthma, would you think the diffusion should be in asthma? Normal? Yeah, normal. And what about COPD? It'll be low. So in patients that I'm trying to differentiate, is this more COPD or is this more asthma? Uh, if they have a normal diffusion, it's probably more likely to be asthma. If the diffusion is lower, it's more likely to be COPD. Well, why, is it, why is it abnormal in COPD? And they have actual destruction of uh, the alveolus. You know, they, the alveoli actually get destroyed, and you have these big, huge um, bulli. So the, the diffusion is just inefficient because right. there's less space for it, area right. for it to diffuse. You actually destroy, you know, alveoli. So you have these big, huge bulli that you know don't have capillaries running through it where they can pick up the oxygen. So whereas asthma, structurally, I mean, in terms of alveolar structure, it, it's pretty normal. Uh, you know, really the conducting down right. 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 What percent is considered abnormal? I don't remember all this. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, is there a, a reading that you like below which? Usually, sixty percent before I would call it abnormal because of the, the, the intricacies of the test. You can also get an increased diffusion and heart failure. Now, asthma can actually increase your diffusion as a patient can hyperventilate. Uh, exercise, left to right shunt, will actually increase your diffusion. Mm -hmm. Is that also um, related to the age of the patient? 
Um, do you normally expect the diffusion to go down if someone goes older or not? We do correct it for age, so there is an age. And it's also important to, to get a hemoglobin. If you're anemic, then your diffusion is going to be lower, um, just based on the fact that you're anemic. Sure. Now, I would think with a smoker, they've already got elevated carboxyhemoglobin because right. of the so you're looking for a change not rather than the absolute... Well, we're not measuring their hemoglobin. We're just measuring what we put in and what we took out. So it doesn't make any difference with their carboxyhemoglobin. So you're not measuring carboxyhemoglobin? We're not measuring on their hemoglobin. We're, we're giving them a CO, and where they're exhaling it, we measure what we put in and what we take out. Oh, okay. So whatever the diffuse, doesn't come the out. The stuff didn't, doesn't come out. It went in. It went in, right. Oh, okay. I thought you did a venipunct. No, we don't, we don't do any blood. No, it's just you, we measure the gas going in, and then we measure it coming out. Well, well, if they are a smoker and have car CO in that might diffuse out, could you ever recover more than you put in? Um, we haven't. I mean, again, it's, it's pretty tightly. It tightly binds mm, the So it doesn't actually come out. It doesn't come out. Yeah, I mean, it's very tightly bound the mm. And, you know, giving a little bit more, they can they can take more on. Even if they've got a, you know, carboxyl level of 5% already, they can get another 0.1% really easy. And we give a teeny tiny amount. It's not enough. You probably even couldn't even measure it. In, I mean, it's, it's that small. It's a very small amount that we're giving. I mean, it's like a single breath of CO. And then we measure, you know, what didn't come back. And so that's that's what diffused it, basically. We know how much we put in. We know how much we get out. Whatever the difference is, was it what got through? Wouldn't there be some dead space? Yeah, there is dead space. We take into account of that. And the other thing is we also take into account volume. Because if you think about it, let's say a patient had a pneumonectomy. They had one lung. Mm. Well, their diffusion is only going to be 50% of normal. But that doesn't mean that that lung is disease. It just means that it's only 50%. So if we accumulate, if we take into consideration volume, we do correct for lung volume, then it could mm. be normal. But the lung that you have left is functioning normally. It's just only half of the lung. So we do take into account volume. Um, we do take into, into account, you know, death space. So all those things are calculated into this. So hopefully we're just saying what's diffusing through the capillary. Hmm. Okay, so bronchoprovocation, uh, and the fellows that have worked with me at Truman know that, that I do a lot of bronchoprovocation um, because I, I really believe that the first question that has to be asked in a patient with, quote, refractory asthma that's sent to a specialist is, do they really have asthma? Uh, and this is a test that, that helps me differentiate that because I see a significant number of people that are referred to me that have failed asthma treatment for a good reason. They don't have asthma. If you don't have asthma, then you're unlikely to respond to asthma treatment. So bronchoprovocation, I think, is important. You can use a lot of different things. But probably the most standardized thing that's used most is methacholine, and that's what we use. You can use histamine. You can use exercise, cold air, allergens. So a lot of different things people use for bronchoprovocation. But probably the most standardized is methacholine. Um, and so we start with increasing concentrations of methacholine, starting at very small concentrations, going up to higher concentrations. We measure FEV1 and FVC after each inhalation. We actually do this just like you do allergy testing. In other words, we do a baseline spirometry, and then we do a control. So we actually do a saline control. We want to make sure that the patient isn't going to respond to saline. So we actually give them saline mm -hmm. to make sure that they're not going to fall with saline. And then we start gradually increasing the, the level of uh, methacholine up. And then a positive test is when we have a reduction in 20% of FEV1 or FVC uh, at one of these concentrations. And then we call that the PC20, partial concentration of methacholine that caused a 20% fall in either FEV1 or FVC. Now, for research purposes, usually the cutoff for asthma is usually 8 milligrams per milliliter or below which is usually um, um, used for, for asthma. So when we're doing some studies, if somebody doesn't have 12% reversibility, then we will need to do methacholine challenge and show that they have an 8 milligram or below PC20 before we can enroll them in the study to say, this patient has asthma. We know for sure that they have asthma. So either 12% or PC20 of, of less than 8. The reason we go up to 16 uh, is that I generally do this test not to diagnose asthma, but to rule out asthma. And it actually has a pretty high negative predictive value. If you go all the way up to 16 milligrams and the patient has no change in their FPV1, FPC, a pretty high chance that that patient does not have asthma. Now, that's assuming they didn't just take eight puffs of albuterol right before they came in for their test. 
Just like in your allergy testing, we have them uh, withhold their long-acting beta agonists for at least three days. We have them uh, withhold their short-acting beta agonists for at least 12 hours. And so we try to uh, get the patient in a situation where they're not uh, having bronchodilators on board. But it is an important test, and it does give us a lot of good information in terms of um, evaluating somebody for, for asthma. And, you know, I think that um, these asthma medicines are expensive, and they have a lot of side effects. And so if somebody does not have asthma, we shouldn't be treating them with asthma medicine. And so I have a low threshold to do methicoline. Now, one of the things about a methicoline challenge is you can only do it on someone that has normal pulmonary functions. Mm -hmm. If you've already got a 50% FEV1, you can't do a methicoline challenge. If you drop them 20% and they're starting at 50%, you don't have much way to go. So clinically, we don't do methicoline challenge if, uh, unless your FEV1 is above 80% predicted. Research-wise, we can bring it down to 70% and we can still do methicoline. But if your FEV1 is 50, you can do uh, bronchodilatation. Right. Yeah, you do, yeah. Right. And you, and you know if their FEV1 FEC is reduced and they have a low FEV1, well, they have obstructive lung disease. You really don't need to do a methicoline challenge. So it's really a test that's done in somebody that has normal spirometry. And then normal spirometry doesn't rule out asthma. A lot of asthmatics have normal spirometry. Um, so mm -hmm. that's why I do do a lot of methicoline challenges, because to sort it out, to try to figure out you know, whether they have asthma, whether they don't have asthma. And I think that this is a helpful, helpful test. It's not 100%. Nothing is 100%. But negative predictive value is pretty good. The only problem that you get in is some patients will only have a drop at 16. What does that tell me? Mm -hmm. Diagnose asthma? No. Does it rule out asthma? No. So it's it's equivocal. But actually, there are not very many people that, that just you know react at, 12, at 16. If they're going to react, they usually react at 8 or lower. So do, do different kinds of asthmatics respond differently to methicoline? Like like there's eosinophilic right. asthma and neutrophilic asthma. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know that. Um, so there's not a differential response yeah. depending on the phenotype. I don't know. I mean that um, you know. I think it's more into severity. Yeah. It is related to severity, and in a lot of studies that we do with anti-inflammatories, we do serial methicolines. Mm -hmm. And as we decrease inflammation, we would expect their MPC20 to go up. So they may start PC20 of 2, and then after you treat them, they may go to PC20 of 6. So that hopefully as you decrease their inflammation, it'll take more methicoline to make them drop. Now, you know, we've been hearing a lot about mannitol. Have, yeah. you, have you started, have you looked into that? We're not doing mannitol. Um, I know people have, have, have been doing it. Um, actually, we, you know, our lab says we can only do whatever is FDA approved. FDA, methicoline is FDA approved for. Well, methicoline is approved now. Is it? I don't know if it is approved or not. I don't know. I don't know our pharmacy is actually looking into getting it, and it's it's, it's, it's a. I know people tool. have been using it as you know as a research tool. I didn't know that it was FDA approved. I think it is. And I was listening to. I was at the California Allergy Society mm -hmm. meeting this weekend, and Bob Lemansky was there talking about the asthma network. Mm -hmm. studies that they're doing, they've switched from methicoline to mannitol mm -hmm. for the whole asthma mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, I haven't read about that, and I think that that would, you know, that would be an, an interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. What was the advantage? Well, what happened was the uh, cost of methicoline went through the ceiling. For some reason, there was a sudden spike in the, in how much the pharmacies are caught charging or what the cost is, and it became so prohibitive. and company that made uh, makes mannitol was willing to give them the product to use for their clinical trials at no charge. And how do you argue with that? Right. Yeah, that's a nice thing. Well, I brought a couple of EFTs just so you guys could, could look at them. We have a few minutes here. And so I'll just kind of... Uh, so why don't you look at this one? Why don't you look at the flow volume loop and tell me the first thing, is that an adequate um, effort? Here, I'll give you a normal one to compare. And for the people online, we should probably either hold it up or try to describe it for them so that they can see it. Do you have just one copy of it? Yeah. you want to hold it up? I don't know. If, no, I doubt that they'll be able to yeah, see I, it. Oh, so let's describe it. Why don't you describe it? Why don't you describe what you see? So describe that. Okay, so... What kind of effort is that? It's not a very good effort because when you look, it's less than one second. Right. And there, it doesn't have a plateau. Right. Either it goes straight up and less than a second. Right. So that the point of that is that you first thing you look at is the is the um, is the curve, and that curve clearly shows that the patient only breathed out about a second. So then that's an inadequate test. 
I mean, you really can't draw any conclusion from that test uh, because it's, it's inadequate. So, I mean, that, that is really the, the key thing, um, you know, for, for, uh, for that. Um, you were saying six seconds is what the effort was, but Dr. Gallagher, you said sometimes for younger kids you'll... We never get six seconds. Yeah, so you'll say... Eight years old, so we can get three or four seconds, we're usually pretty happy. But you would like to see at least a plateau. Yeah. Right. So, so if your if your curve's still going up, you're probably not adequate. But if your curve is flat at the end, then you probably have an adequate. So for adults, we usually use six seconds. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly you, for younger kids, you can use. But you know, then you would have this flat. On as a plateau. Yeah. You go until the plateau. Right. So until you get a plateau. Right. Right. So you know that would be. Uh, and is it a one second plateau last three or not necessarily need to be for time? It's just that there's a plateau. <clears throat> there should be a plateau. Yeah, I don't know if it's ever been delineated at what time. Uh, a couple more here. There's an awful lot of blowing. Here's the. Some here people poop out. They do. I mean, we it, ta it takes hours to do this test. Here's the test right here. If you want to look at it. But one of the things for the effort is is that for each concentration of methacholine, they have to do at least three spirometries, and they have to be within five percent on each effort. So they have to, uh, you know, and that's that's what our um, our standard thing is is that we you have to do at least three times, and you have to have at least a five percent uh, variability. And so if you're, if you're trying to game it, you're trying to say, okay, well, I'm not going to blow as hard as I, I really want to blow. But you can't uh, blow 50% uh, effort each and every time, exactly 50%. It's just going to be one time is going to be 70, 40, 60. And so when we have all this variability and the text sees that the uh, efforts are all over the place, he says, this is not, it's not reproducible. So if the effort's not reproducible, then it's not valid. But but how how much of a provocation is doing a PFT in a severe asthmatic? We wouldn't just doing the test itself provoke obstruction. You would think so, but it's like it, exercise. Almost. Yes, but it you know it, it doesn't. We we have people that you know that can. I mean, we do these research studies where they're in, they're doing PFTs all the time. And if you have a good check and you let the patient rest and you give them time, uh, I mean, these methacholines will literally take two or three hours to do. I mean, because they let them rest and let them recover before they, they started doing it again. But yeah, you have to have three efforts that were within 5% of your... And then the other is is that sometimes I've seen fellows misinterpret and say, oh, well, they dropped 20% there. I said, yeah, well, they dropped there on one effort. They had two more efforts, and those two efforts were actually below 20%. We take the best of the three. We don't mm. take the worst of the three. So the best effort was only an 18% drop. So they didn't drop. So you have to look at all three efforts on, at each level, and then see, and then you have to get the best of those efforts. Right. The other thing is that when you're doing the methacholine, it's um, not a, always um, a logarithmic as you expect right. it to be. So you may drop 18 percent. Right. If someone says, "Well, it's not 20 percent," let's give them the next dose. And sometimes you're actually better off just waiting five minutes or whatever before even considering it to another PFT, and they've dropped 20 percent by then. You you don't have to. Because um, sometimes that can drop quite a bit, right? Very quickly. Yeah. Okay. You, now, in addition, you can also do antigen challenges yeah, sure. and histamine challenges. Yeah, other. Yeah. When when would you ever decide to to use a different agent as a provocation? Some people, for uh, say exercise induced asthma, will use cold air. Um, and I know at, at Ohio State, for when they evaluate their athletes, they do cold air uh, challenges. Um, mm -hmm. They also do exercise. You can do exercise challenge where you actually exercise them on a treadmill. Um, and you can um, and you can do uh, you know, spirometry after that. So there's you know there's a lot of you know different ways that, that you can do it. In terms of the the gold standard in the PFT literature right now is methacholine, um, and all the other ones are kind of add on you know um, a test. But you know I, I think that certainly for for exercise induced you can do exercise or cold air, and either one of those I think are it sort of depends on the purpose of the. Right. I suppose. right. If you're looking for exercise induced asthma, if you're looking for occupational induced asthma and you have a specific irritant from the occupation, people have used that. So if they have a you know a, a trigger from the occupation, then they'll use that in the lab to see if that's causing them occupational asthma. And I know that when they're studying new new pharmaceutical agents, uh, they'll use a different agents to provoke the episode to see what the mechanism of action of the new pharmaceutical is. If, 
if drug X is a bronchodilator and you want to see if it protects, you can see whether it protects against histamine, right. not the choline, the antigen, and, and it may protect against one thing but not another, and that gives you an indication of what the mechanism of action of the new drug is. Yeah, sure, sure. So how, how would you interpret these exactly like this? Okay, so this is a methacholine challenge, and so we did a baseline spirometry, and it was normal. Then we gave them control, we gave them normal saline. Then we gave them 0.06, and then we went all the way up to 16. They only had a 9% decrease. And then, as the tech is instructed, he gives them an aerosol with albuterol, because the patient has to have the same FB1 we want when they leave is what they came. And so then he gave them an aerosol treatment, and really this is a negative methacholine challenge. There was no, there's not any so that's the percent increase, like decrease the, that's already calculated. The percent out. PC is the percent change. Right. So, um, so you don't actually look at the numbers. So it's one, three, five, one. Gotcha. The, you know, it's really not any more than seven percent down. Right. So this is a negative methacholine challenge. They went all the way up to 16 milligrams. Now, if I gave you enough methacholine, if I gave you 100 milligrams of methacholine, everyone would you make everyone weak. I see, Brock, you had a question. Did you want to go ahead, Brock? Yeah, yeah, Jay. Um, that was an interesting review on this. Uh, I'm kind of wondering, what is the effect on the flow loop in a, in a say, a moderate asthmatic of altitude? Of altitude? That, yeah, does that affect anything? Well, altitude will decrease your oxygenation uh, because, you know, you obviously um, have a higher altitude and you're going to have less uh, PaO2, so it will, it will cause some increase in minute ventilation. Um, uh, in terms of the, the airway function, it shouldn't have a direct effect on airway function, and so your spirometry should be the same at, at high uh, altitude as low level, although a patient may have more subjective dyspnea because they're Respiratory rate may be higher because you have to have an increased amount of ventilation well, uh, to provide oxygen. One thing that's quite noticeable is the drop in saturation, but right. also uh, increase in heart rate. So right. what do you do with those those people when they're, do uh, you make any recommendations when they go to high altitude? Uh, in terms of, there are some, some, uh, some recommendations, particularly for COPD patients that fly, because the airlines do not completely pressurize the cabins. It's about 7,000 feet, right? right? So oftentimes we'll have a patient, if they have a borderline O2 sat, you know, um, in Kansas City and they're getting on an airplane, we will prescribe supplemental oxygen for them uh, when they fly because they may need supplemental oxygen at high altitude where they didn't need it in Kansas City. So they may need additional oxygen at, at high altitude uh, if their saturations are borderline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you ever wonder why they only do it at to 7,000 feet on the airlines? Uh, it's a cost thing because, um, you know, when you pressurize the cabin, it obviously puts pressure in and you would have to have a thicker wall of your mm -hmm. plane, which would right. make it heavier, right. would make more fuel. And so they do the balance and they say, we're going to pressurize it. Use less stuff. pressure, you can have thinner walls, lighter right. plane, and use less mm -hmm. fuel. Right. The higher pressure you're going to have, you're going to have to have thicker walls and it's going to have heavier planes and you have to use more fuel. Mm -hmm. Basically, right. a financial deal. Yeah, the zero percent humidity is also a problem for a lot of. It's very dry, right? So you're having dry air, and you're having air that's you know that's not completely pressurized uh, to to sea level. So you know that's that's the issue. Yeah, one of the other provocations that I've heard of is eucapnic eucapnic hyperventilation. We have the patient breathing really fast, but uh, a, a, a mixture of that has carbon dioxide, right. so they don't become hypocarbic. Right. And you can do that. I mean, there's even some, you can have them, you know, breathe a hypoxic gas mixture to try to simulate what it would be like at, at altitude. Usually what we do is, if your SAT's 90, 91, 92, and you're going to fly, we're going to give you supplemental oxygen if you're mm -hmm. kind of borderline. But you can't, I mean, you can uh, give them a hypoxic gas mixture, you know, mm -hmm. to breathe. And then, just to point out, I think I have one case here where it's, um, this is a um, mixed disorder, so some people can have obstruction and restriction. So this lady has sarcoid, and she has an FPV1, FPC ratio of 74%, no reversibility, uh, but her total lung capacity is only 57% of predicted. Her diffusion is only 26% of predicted. So she really has a mixed disorder, uh, which oftentimes you see with sarcoid, where they have obstruction and restriction. So normally in restriction, you'd see a normal or increased uh, ratio. Well, her ratio is as low as 74% or predicted was 82. Uh, her force body capacity was 49% of predicted. Her FEV1 was 51% of predicted. Her ratio was 74%. And her 
total lung capacity is only 64% of predicted. So she really has a mixed disorder. She's got obstruction uh, and restriction um, with a low FEV1 FEC ratio, a low diffusion, uh, a low uh, total lung capacity. And so this, this really um, is um, a mixed disorder. And then I have one, I think, with the COPD here, yeah. So this is the one I was talking about. It's the guy with COPD. He's got an FEV1 of uh, 0.99. It goes up to 1.16 after bronchodilation. It's a 17% improvement, but it's not a 200. Not 200. It's not 200 cc. So this man, I would say, does not have uh, bronchodilation. In fact, our computer um, picked that up. Island administration of bronchodilation, there's no significant response because it's not 200 cc. And then when you look at his four volume loop, um, you know, he's, he's got an obstructive pattern. So it has to be both, it has to be both 200 cc's and 12%. Um, although, that being said, I have, there's about 20% of COPD patients that do demonstrate reversibility. They have 12% and 200 cc's, but they don't have asthma. They have COPD. Um, they just have airway reversibility. So it doesn't alone differentiate asthma from COPD. And there are a significant number of asthmatics that don't have 12% reversibility. So. It's not a. It's not a hundred percent. It's not a. You know, you can't completely rely on reversibility to differentiate asthma from COPD. It's more complicated than that. I had a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um, with vocal cord dysfunction, the one, the cases that I've seen, they actually have symptoms like with exercise, let's say. Mm -hmm. So then, if you would do a flow loop when they're, you know, not exercising and feeling normal, it would be normal. Mm -hmm. And then if you would do one after exercise, then they'd have right. cancer. Drug. Um, with like a tumor or a vocal cord paralysis, would you have more of a fixed where just when they're, you know, without exercise it would actually have a fixed? No, even with the tumor, um, if you exercise you get you worse. increased flow, you're going to get worse. Right. If you have increased flow and you need increased But it doesn't necessarily do that. That wouldn't differentiate it, no. Because if you've got, I mean, we've got people with tumors in their throat and they say, when I walk up steps I get more short of breath and they have right. to breathe more. Then you get more turbulent flow, they get more obstruction. So they could potentially have a normal loop. Um, at without rest. exercise, yeah. Sure, right. you can have a normal loop at, at rest. So sometimes you would maybe want to trigger them with, with exercise. And I know the EMT people, um, they can trigger with uh, perfume or exercise when they're looking for uh, vocal cord dysfunction because they want to do some kind of trigger. Because at rest, they may be normal. Okay. Well, well this has been very helpful. We okay. truly do appreciate this presentation. We're going to have to stop here. Okay. Um, we're going to take about a two-minute break. I see that Dr. Nelson has logged on, so I'll uh, we'll help set that up. We'll resume in about two minutes and, uh, and hear about immunotherapy. Thank you, Dr. Salzman, for sure. this Thank presentation. You. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been Conferences on Minology from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. We'll be back in about two minutes. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>